All right. Good morning. Good morning and thanks for joining us for another installment of the Melissa Institute Innovations in Violence Prevention and Treatment Series. I am Etione Aldarondo, Executive Director of the Melissa Institute. For the past 27 years, uh, the Melissa Institute for Violence Prevention and Treatment has been a trusted source of scientific information on violence prevention, safe communities, and mental health worldwide. Today, more than 100,000 people from over 130 countries have benefited from the Institute's educational resources and trainings. In addition, we frequently consult with and provide information on violence prevention and treatment to diverse organizations locally in South Florida and across the country. It is very exciting for us to see you today at today's event and, and to notice that, just to say, that we have registered participants from various parts of the United States, as well as from the United Kingdom, Australia, and China. Welcome all. Please know that the Melissa Institute trainings, like the one that you're about to see, and the educational materials accessible through our websites and YouTube channel are available for free. All that we ask in exchange is that you use these materials to support your efforts to repair the world. And if your situation allows, allow you that you consider donating to support our programs. Today, we have the pleasure of bringing to you Dr. George Bonanno, professor of clinical psychology at Teachers College, Columbia University, who will talk about trauma and, res and the resilience paradox, the key role of regulatory flexibility. You can find details about Dr. Bonanno's distinguished academic trajectory in the event page bio. I hope that Dr. Bonanno's work and ideas serves as somewhat of an antidote to the considerable fear, frustration, and sorrow experienced by so many of us affected in different ways by the wars abroad and the sociopolitical discontent at home. As you may have heard me say before, at the Melissa Institute, our hearts bleed for victims of violence everywhere, and we're resolved to continue our efforts to promote safety, mental health, and peace in our communities and beyond. We ask that you do the same. With nothing else to say, I'll pass you Dr. Bonanno. Thank you, Itoni. Itoni. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, have a chance to speak with everybody today. I'm going to uh, share my screen and show you my, uh, so I can, we can, you can see my slides there. Um, there we go. Um, okay, so I, I put together um, uh, a, a kind of a review of my thoughts about trauma and resilience and how we manage to get through these aversive events, put some new things in here uh, for this presentation that I hope is uh, of use to you and of interest to you. I want to begin with this slide, and this is typically how I begin my talks, bad things happen. We know this, we, we are all familiar with these kinds of events. Right now, as you know, very bad things are happening in the Middle East and elsewhere in the, across the globe. Um, and we these are pretty difficult, uh, demanding, one might even say horrific events that we would rather not have gone go through. We, 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 we fear them. We tend to think of these events as traumas. But what's kind of curious about these events, if I can use that phrase, is that they're common. Epidemiological research shows us that most people experience at least one event like this and often several in the course of their lives, which raises the question what we mean when we say trauma. It also raises questions about the, the different kinds of reactions that we might have, including what we'll call resilience. Now, before I get into that, I want to detour a little bit and tell you a story. This is uh, a New York City garbage truck, a sanitation truck. This is a common sight in New York City. I live in New York City. Um, and these are massive trucks. These weigh, when they're fully loaded, they weigh 25 tons. Um, they, they are big and fast, and you could say dangerous. They break the law. And I've seen this many times in the time I've been living in New York City. They go through red lights, they go the wrong way down a one-way street, and they turn red on a, uh, they make a right turn on a red light, which is illegal in New York City. 
doing all these things and they're somewhat not paying attention, you could say, because they're going pretty quickly down the street and picking up the trash, they are um, really dangerous for pedestrians. Now, a, a sanitation truck, a garbage truck fits into this story, I wanna tell you. This was December 21st, 2009, uh, 1.30 in the morning. A young man named Jed, J-E-D, was getting off of work at a restaurant down in Greenwich Village. It was very cold, it was about 20 degrees, which I think is negative five Celsius. He had just gotten off work. He walked to the light. There was some, some traffic in the streets, but not too much. He remembers seeing the ice shimmering off the pavement because it was so cold. He waited, he had a red light. He waited for the, the walk signal to cross. He got the walk signal when the light changed and out of nowhere came a, a, one of these garbage trucks, a sanitation truck making an illegal right turn, clipped him and pulled him under the truck. It, the, the wheels of the truck, there are 10 wheels on these trucks, five on each side, all five wheels on the right side of the truck ran over his leg and part of his hip, crushing it to just a mass of blood and bone. He screamed wildly, his voice echoing in the street that, that night. The fire department came, the police came, they were trying to keep him alive. They weren't sure he would make it. He was bleeding profusely. Um, he remembers hearing people screaming, put a rush on the bus, which is what first responders say when they want the ambulance to get there. The ambulance was delayed in traffic and people were screaming, put a rush on the bus, get it here. They finally, the ambulance finally got there after over 20 minutes, got him to a hospital where they put him into a medically induced coma. The doctors realized pretty quickly he was gonna need a lot of surgeries if they were to save his life or maybe keep his leg. And in the end, he lost his entire left leg and part of his hip. He had 20 surgeries after six weeks in, the, in a coma and eight infections, then they brought him out of the coma. This is what he looks like now. Um, he's a striking individual, an interesting individual. Um, he also um, is missing too much of his body. People sometimes do a double take when they see him because he's missing so much of his body. That's Jed. This is also Jed. He's a charming guy. He's very uh, personable, handsome, intelligent man, and he's really likable. This is also Jed. He is an avid skier. He was an avid skier before the accident. He learned how to ski on one leg and he skis now. I want to show you a short one and a half minute clip about Jed um, that was made about him by the gymnasium that he uses. He uses a, a national chain of gymnasiums and they, were, they thought um, they would make this movie about him and show it in their gymnasiums. Um, and they hired a good filmmaker to do that. made quite a beautiful little film. I wanna show you this little minute and a half film. Unfortunately, I am in the film too. That I think that was a bad choice on their part, but they, they felt like he, he, his life should be in the film. And he was working with me at the time as a doctoral student, that's how I met him. So I'm gonna show you this film. Um, and it, it'll play for just, just very briefly. Megan always told me to remember her cell number. I thought it was strange, but I memorized it anyway. It was December and past midnight. I got a light at the crosswalk. It was cold. I must have my throat. The ambulance took almost 20 minutes. I was holding the first responder's hand throughout, saying Megan's number over and over again. It was a transition, a transformation. The accident prompted a shift in direction, and I began to think about the psychology of these incidents. I'm now working on a PhD in psychology in Columbia, and studying under Dr. George McDonald. George's work centers on trauma, how and why we recover, and theories of resilience. In his lab, we work with people who have recently suffered a loss or bereavement. We're looking for patterns, reasons, and answers. Being healthy and treating my body right was important to me before the accident, and it still is. In this new body, I've had to adapt and forge new ways. Michelle helped immensely.
makes no excuses. I get the same treatment as everyone else. Mm -hmm. What I've learned, what I'm now studying, is that the ability to rebound and heal is the norm. When we're knocked down, we get back up and continue forward. It's in all of us. It's the human condition. Everything I do is not me. It's human. This is what we do. Okay, I hope that you could hear that. It occurred to me when I began the video that I may not have um, informed uh, the the production team that this video was going to have sound, but I hope you heard that. Um, it's a nice, nice soundtrack for it. Now, when Jed was coming out of the coma, the doctors decided now that they'd done their surgeries, they would bring him out of the coma. His family was really worried. That, well, how would he react to having his leg missing and what he'd been through? But he said, I had a sense that my leg was really messed up, like on the pavement. I could see it was bad. I was on death's door. So on some level, I already knew. And for whatever reason, I woke up thinking that it was gone already. I was not surprised. But what about the traumatic memories? Jed said, I remember just being pummeled with these memories. I kept replaying the accident. The memories had a deep valence, you know, like a sort of a deep traumatic valence. And I thought, oh, wow, I can't believe I have to process all this. But then to his surprise, in just a few days, it's the intrusive, intrusive thoughts and memories simply stopped. And Jed said, I thought how funny that was, how the salience of those memories faded. And I no longer had the type of intense reaction to those memories that I did when I first woke up. And this was confusing for him. Jed said, I had burning questions. I was mostly wondering why I wasn't more messed up. I was really puzzled. You know, if everybody gets PTSD, why was I doing okay? That was my question really. Why was I doing okay? And we can ask the same question. Why was Jed doing okay? Why was he so resilient? Why is anybody resilient? This is what I wanna focus on today. I'm gonna to tell you about three, what I call three axioms of resilience. First, resilience to potential trauma is common. It's not an unusual phenomenon. Jed is a remarkable guy, but he's not, uh, uh, he's not Superman. He's a, he's, a, he's a human being like everybody else. Having certain key traits alone will not make us resilient. And there is actually no, no, thing, no such thing as a resilient type. We'll get into that a little bit. And also my third point, resilience, and actually the way we find our way to resilience is we engage with the stressor and each time work out the best response. And I call that flexibility. So I'm gonna go through all of these points in this order during the talk. We'll begin with the first point, resilience is common. I first began to argue this in, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century really, in this paper in 2004, uh, I made the point pretty strongly um, this was a good experience. It was pretty well received, this paper. It had some impact, which was, was also good, uh, rewarding. It, there were also some naysayers, some critics of this idea, and some pushback, but generally it was pretty well received. Now, at the time, and we still, to some extent, still do, we tend to think of these events, highly aversive events, potentially traumatic events, we think of them largely in terms of psychological damage. We think of, and we, we think of them in binary terms, either we have PTSD or we don't. We have complicated grief or prolonged grief or we don't. We are depressed or we're not. But the binary, you know, this is the binary categories, this kind of binary approach has had its advantages. It's helped us to, to understand these events. It's led to lots of research and treatment, but it is very limited when we really try to understand these events for several reasons. I won't go into all those reasons now, but I think the most important for what we're talking about today is that it's too simplistic. It fails to account for the diversity, the heterogeneity, the different types of ways that people respond. Another way to, to put this is that health is more than the absence of disease. 
So let me show you what I mean. When I first began my career now in right around 19, in the, in the late eighties, early nineties, um, this was the, this is, was the model. We had a, a traumatic event. I don't use the phrase traumatic event anymore. I use potentially traumatic event or the acronym PTE to capture the potential nature of these events. Not with their, they're not always traumatic. They're potentially traumatic. We have a, P, a PTE, we have a continuum of time, and then we have a continuum of health from say, you know, health to a lot of symptoms and distress. If somebody develops chronic PTSD or chronic depression, et cetera, it'll look something like that. They'll have elevated symptoms and distress for at least a couple of years, which is very unpleasant, very painful, a little bit of variability, but it's pretty much a lot of symptoms and distress. But then everybody else, if we only have two categories, there's only one other category left and that we don't have a name for. We can call it non-PTSD, non-psychopathology, health, resilience, None of those words is correct. None of those words capture this, this huge number of people. Most people don't develop chronic PTSD or depression. So they're in this large category. And if we're looking at this over time, we have no idea where people are. Are they spread out evenly? Are they bunched at the top or you know, in the middle? We just don't know. And I've argued for most of my career, if we don't understand health and resilience and the ability to adapt, how can we understand something like PTSD? How can we understand an abnormal reaction? Now, when I began my career, I was got very interested in this. In 1991, I remember very clearly, I got particularly interested in this part of the graph, um, where I was you know, wondering, what about people who show very few symptoms, little or no symptoms, little or no enduring consequences of these events? At the time, that was considered extremely rare, and by some, in some quarters, it was considered pathological, as if there's something wrong with people who don't show these kinds of reactions. So that was very intriguing for me, and I wanted to learn more about that. And I set about trying to study these events, and as I've been doing that for the last 30 years, trying to map these different patterns. What, are the, what patterns are there out there? We tried to do this largely by mapping different trajectories, different trajectories over time. After now so many years, we have a pretty good idea of both of the trajectories and how prevalent they are. So we know there's a trajectory of chronic symptoms. If we say PTSD symptoms, people with chronically elevated PTSD symptoms. And that ranges from five to about 30%. 30% is the most we ever see, which is an awful lot. Usually it's five to 10%. Then we've seen this pattern, which we call the recovery pattern. And this is a, a, a group of people who show an acute reaction, and it takes them a while to get back to their normal healthy baseline, maybe a year or two. This is not a fun pattern. This is difficult, but th this is different than the, the chronic reaction. Then finally, we see this pattern. It's not delayed PTSD. It's more like a moderate level of symptoms, some struggle that gradually gets worse. We don't see this kind of out of the blue delayed reactions that, that we often hear about. We don't actually ever see those when we track people over time, but we do see that pattern. So these patterns, we have a pretty good idea what they look like, how many people are in them. We're beginning to understand how to predict those patterns. But what about this area on the graph down here? Now you can probably guess given the percentages where I'm going with this, this was the area that we thought would, that, that it was assumed there'd be very few people. It turned out this is where most people were when we actually looked. When we looked and followed people over time, we found that the, the most common pattern was actually what we call resilience. And it turned out to be the majority pattern. This is a stable trajectory of healthy functioning. There's often a little bit of uh, upheaval right around the time of the event. That's quite natural. But other than that, the, the, this group of people is showing a pretty stable trajectory of healthy functioning after the event. They're moving on with their lives. This slide uh, shows you just some of the recent studies. The studies on the left, you can see the, 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 the studies and the ones with an asterisk come out of my lab, but other people now have started to do, use this approach. We kind of um, uh, pioneered this approach in the early uh, 20th century, and now this has been used by a lot of people. On the right, you can see the different types of events in these studies, and there's some pretty nasty things in here, mass shootings, hurricanes, um, bereavement, traumatic injury, combat deployment, spinal cord injury, et cetera, et cetera. 
And you can see in all of these events on the far right, the majority of people showed that resilience trajectory, that stable trajectory of healthy functioning. We recently did a review of these studies. This was published in 2018. So up until 2018, we found 67 different studies. That's a lot of research. They use different modeling approaches, so it wasn't all the same. Did we do this with computational modeling? So it wasn't all the, um, all the same type of computational modeling, which is important. So we're not fixing um, the one particular approach. There were all kinds of different potentially traumatic events. And across all of these studies, the most common response was this resilience trajectory on average in around two thirds of the people in the studies. So this to me seems kind of like the golden mean. This is the, uh, the average we can expect around two thirds of people exposed to these events will show this stable trajectory of healthy functioning afterwards. They'll be able to move on without any real lasting damage. But there's still a third who does it. And that's a lot of people. And we see these people, this group of people show these one of these three patterns typically. And there's sometimes other patterns, recovery, that acute pattern, chronic, or this sort of delayed or gradual onset. So this is what the research is telling us now after all these years. What about COVID? And that COVID was, an un, was a complete mystery when it began. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, <clears throat> many people thought it was a traumatic event. It was very disturbing, lots of unknowns. But would we see the same patterns? Many people would have said, no, it, it'll be much worse. So we wanted to try to do this during COVID. Now, I was living in New York City, where I, I live in New York City. And um, I was asked by the Association for Psychological Science to write something for their website about remaining resilient during the pandemic. This was in March of 2020. I was actually out of the country and had just returned to New York and things got very bad very quickly in New York City. So I wanted to write this piece. Um, this is, you can see that the death toll in New York City around that time and by mid April, it was at its maximum, 800 people were dying a day in New York City from COVID. So it was really getting bad. Um, this was a common site. This is a refrigerator morgue, a makeshift morgue. This is outside of a hospital. There was one of these right down the street from my apartment. I rode my bicycle past it regularly. And you know, there are dead bodies in there. Right? It's a disturbing thing to see that out on the street. This was a site I thought I'd never see. This were hospital tents in Central Park. Um, this right near Mount Sinai Hospital, which is on the park on the east side. And there were just, the, the hospital was overflowing, so they moved tents out into the park. And I, again, I rode my bicycle past this spot on a regular basis. And in, in true New York form, New Yorkers adapt, and one day I was riding by in my bicycle, and I saw a young couple having a picnic just outside this fence. They thought, well, that's a nice grassy area. I'll have a pic we'll have a picnic there. Despite all of these things going on at that time, I still felt that most people would be able to cope with the stress of COVID. So this is what I said in this article, the majority of humans have coped well repeatedly and are resilient to just about any adversity and we will be too during COVID. Not everybody was thrilled that I had said that. However, now that we have time, uh, as time passed, we were able to, people were collecting data and we were able to do these longitudinal studies. Here's one we did in Israel. And we found that the majority of people showed the resilience trajectory. This was depression and anxiety. This is a study of depression and anxiety in Poland. Again, we found the majority during COVID, the majority showed the resilience trajectory. This was a study we did in Hubei province in China. Hubei province, as you probably know, is where the city of Wuhan is. And Wuhan was the beginning of the pandemic. Hubei province then instigated what I think it's fair to say was the strictest lockdown in recorded history. They, made it, they basically locked down this entire province, province to, to try to contain the, the virus. We were able to get measures of depression, anxiety, and PTSD symptoms in April of 2020. That was right at the end of that lockdown. So we got people who'd just been through this horrific lockdown, this very, very, I shouldn't say horrific, but this very demanding, very frightening lockdown. And what we found was, again, the majority showed the resilience trajectory for each one of these measurements. There's some variability in different measurements, but they're all in the majority. 
since then, my colleagues in Germany, uh, this is a paper from the lab of Klaus Lieb and his postdoc, Sarah Schaffer, and they put together a, a meta-analysis of all the trajectory studies done during COVID. And they found 26 different studies. I was surprised there were so many. This is a graph from their study. On the left, in the lower left, you can see this. This is a slide they reproduced or adapted from our review that, that happened in 2018 of the 67 studies. They, they threw four studies out because they weren't actually population studies, fair. And they, they've, they uh, reproduced our findings for these 63 studies. Resilience was 65, 66% basically. Then in their analysis of studies during COVID, they had 26 more studies that happened during COVID in the time since our review, and they found the exact same percentage. The percentage of resilient people to COVID was exactly the same, surprisingly so, just exactly the same as it was prior to COVID. So basically people are still adapting to this new and novel and very disturbing uh, odd events. Okay, so this, now it brings us to the very important question of why are people so resilient? Why are most people resilient and others not? Why is it two thirds? A host of questions. It's really intriguing from a scientific viewpoint, but just in terms of public health and us, under, us humans understanding what we go through. Why does it look this way? It's something we really want to know. Here's a very common answer. These are, the, uh, these are the kind of things that were actually common during the COVID pandemic. Uh, newspaper headlines, magazine headlines, sometimes even in academic or professional journals and publications. This idea that resilient people share uh, a small number of key traits. Um, the fact that these, these articles all say three, five, and seven should, should cause you to wonder a little bit because those are kind of like magic numbers. Those are, are fairy tale numbers. Uh, it's a little too convenient that they're talking about three, five, or seven. That makes me a little uh, uh, dubious of the phenomenon. But the idea is also, I think, questionable that it would be that simple. It'd be nice if it were so simple. Simple is nice. We, we can fix things when they're simple. But these popular conceptions of resilience, there are a lot of them, and they're all somewhat similar. So people share these key traits. Their resilience is a matter of who you are, your personality, people are born resilient or not. Uh, there's this one that is a good one. There's one way to cope that you can always rely on. There's a kind of a fail safe way to cope. Uh, and that resilient people don't struggle. Resilient people, they just kind of breeze through things. Really none of these are true. These are, are myths that have really no research evidence, no evidence to support them. So what do we see? Well, first, let me make this point. Having certain key traits alone will not make us resilient. There is no resilient type. That's the main takeaway here. Why do I say that? What do we actually see? This slide shows you a number of the different factors that have been correlated with resilience, the things that, that, that you could say are predictors of resilience, of that resilient outcome. There are about 50 at least on this slide and counting because as the more research we do, the more we find. We keep finding new things when we look for new things. And I've color coded these. Um, so I won't go through this slide in any detail, but I've color coded them just to, to give a little organization to it. The blue are the things that we bring to an event, who we are, our genes, our personality, the resources we have, what we believe, um, what life experiences we have, just what our life is going into something when something bad happens, the context, who we are in the context. The, the magenta color is what happens during the event. Two or three people can be, go through the same event and they're going to have very different, different experiences. So we think about right now what's going on in Israel and the Gaza Strip. There, there are millions of people there and all those people are, go, have different, are having different experiences. If we then also look at what happens afterwards, that's the white uh, part of the slide. This is what happens to us and what we do after an event that also influences our, it also correlates with resilience. So 
First of all, instead of having three or five or seven sort of key traits or magic traits, we have at least 50 and we keep finding more. So we have to make somehow make sense of that. It's not so simple that there are a few key things. On top of that, which is um, makes this even harder to uh, decode, the effects are really small. This is a statistical phrase, small effects or small effect size. But what it means in plain English is that each one of these things only give, tells us a little bit about who will be resilient and who not. It only moves the needle just a little bit. They don't have that much of an impact on the outcome. So none of these things is are the key traits because none of them do a lot. They all do a little bit. So that's a puzzle. This is a puzzle I've thought about for most of my career. How do we make sense of this? And it got more complicated when we began to realize that all these things contribute just little bits to the puzzle, to the, to the answer. So what do we do here? How do we make sense of this? Well, one thing we tried in recent years was to use machine learning, uh, you know, AI. Um, and we thought, well, maybe that'll tell us a lot. And it did tell us some things, didn't answer the question, but it did tell us some things. Here are three recent studies I was involved in. First study, we used polygenic scores. So what polygenic scores are, they're genome-wide scores. The, a person's entire genome is, um, is examined, well, a group of people, lots of people, they're, they're, each one of their genomes are looked at, the, all the, the spots on the genome. We have about 10,000 genes and, and another, you know, many, many more locations on genes that do things gene expression and whatnot. And they're normed against outcomes. And you get a profile for the entire genome, which genes are doing something. So you might have a gene a polygenic score for, for PTSD. What are the things, the genetic factors that explain PTSD? Or one for body mass index, or one for immune functioning, or one for intelligence or uh, achievement in life. And uh, we, have, we have polygenic scores for many things now. They're very well uh, well-researched, they're reliable. So we, we looked at 21 different polygenic scores in this study. In the middle study, the second study, we had people who came to the emergency department for a traumatic stressor, traumatic injury, an accident, something like that. In this case, we had lots of biological factors that are routinely assessed in the emergency departments. We added our own, we added psychological variables and some psychological tests. We ended up with 70 different variables. In the third study, that's the Hubei study I told you about earlier, where we did this in Hubei province in China. In this study, we had both person-level variables, things about the person, and um, contextual variables, so the place where they lived, um, uh, how many hospitals in the region, how, what attitudes toward, toward COVID, um, what kind of resources in that region, et cetera, schools, et cetera. We had 60 different variables in this study. Now, using machine learning, then you know we let it, we we'll let the, the the algorithm run many, many times till we till we till it arrives at an algorithm, and we did improve prediction, but it was still modest, despite having all of this information. We still weren't doing this. We weren't we weren't predicting as with as much accuracy as, accuracy as we hoped, but more important than that. We didn't see any key predictors. There was no consistency across these studies in the key factors that are driving this. It was kind of like a little bit here, a little bit there. So this was interesting. We moved the, we, we moved the research forward a little bit, but we didn't really answer the question of how we know who's going to be resilient and who's not. And this I call the resilience paradox. We know a lot about the things that correlate with resilience, but we can't predict who will be resilient with much actual accuracy? That's the paradox. We tend to idealize this question. So if this, if resilience is a pie, we tend to think it looks like this, so these huge pie slices. And these are these key factors. And they, if we get enough of them, these key factors, we've explained who's resilient and who not. And then we, our job moves over to training people to become resilient and we train them in these key factors. But that's the idealized pie because none of the research shows that's true. The realistic pie looks more like this with a lot of small factors. And even when we can measure many things, we still have a lot of small factors. And often we don't even explain half of it. Sometimes we do, 
but often we don't. The, the factors themselves stay really small. And in fact, because we're in a kind of a machine learning model, we're looking at how things relate to each other too. They're correlated with each other. So their individual comp contribution is even smaller. So we're not answering that question. And what this tells us then is, we, it, gives, it, it gives us a slightly different question. How do we know how people who are resilient do this? How do they understand that? What do they do? How do they utilize these, these different factors that we've been identifying? How do they make sense of it? Because they do, so what are they doing? That's really the question. And that's the paradox. Now, I think I have a pretty good solution to this paradox now. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly excited about it, fairly confident that we're on the right path now. I wanna tell you about that. First, some background. There's some things that we can reason out that help us solve this paradox. First of all, we know that every challenge we face is different. Coping with a hurricane is very different than coping with a terrorist attack, which is different than coping with abuse, which is different than coping with a loss, which is different than coping with a medical emergency or a disease pandemic or a, a civil war or um, you know, you take the situation in the Middle East right now, that's very different than other types of situations we might lump it together with, other wars say, or other terrorist events. Each time we go through an event, it's a new kind of challenge. They're all very different. The task is very different. And the challenge also tends to change within the same event across time because events change across time. And we know a lot of things about potentially traumatic events. We know, for example, that initially people feel a lot of shock, maybe confusion, numbness. Then they begin to have intrusive thoughts, really disturbing thoughts about the event, images, memories that they don't really like. They might have nightmares. Uh, they're on edge, heightened arousal. This is making people very anxious. It feels like the event is still very fresh and can keep happening. That might then give way to a sense of apprehension. Apprehension. We might restrict our activities. We might fear that it's going to happen again. We might feel like the world has changed, that we're now in great danger. People sometimes begin to worry even that they have PTSD. Um, early on, when it's too early to say if somebody has PTSD, I've known this from people I've talked with, they'll ask, you know, I've had a nightmare twice now. Does that mean I have PTSD? And that question itself creates anxiety in people because PTSD is now a very common phrase. We, people know what PTSD means and it makes them anxious. Maybe I have PTSD. So this, this, the, the challenges, the thing we're struggling with is a moving target within the same event. Okay, so situational challenges vary across events. So events are different, but also across time in the same event. We know this. Another very important point is that all the things we can do that might help us cope with it, all our traits and behaviors and resources, including the things that have been associated with resilience, they all have both benefits and costs. And this is a very important point. We see this in the animal kingdom. We see this in literally in microscopic uh, creatures, if we can use that phrase, and other animals as well as in humans. It's, a, it's something, it's a facet of nature. There's no such thing as a perfect behavior, perfect adaptation. Everything has its benefits and costs. And one of my favorite examples is the peacock's colorful tail. This is a peacock. Everybody knows what a peacock looks like. They're beautiful birds, they're large birds. And they have this in the males, the peacock is the male, has this enormous tail and they're beautiful and they can, Shim, make that tail shimmer. They, they, um, they, they kind of, I don't know how they do is that the muscles in their back, they slightly twitch their, their, their tail feathers and it makes those eyes seem like they're floating on a shimmering sea. It's quite a sight to see. Now, as beautiful this, as this bird is, the father of evolutionary theory, the great naturalist, naturalist Charles Darwin said this in 1860, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. Now, why on earth would Darwin say this? He said this in 1860 in a letter to a botanist, Asa Gray, who was one of his supporters. He had just published The Origin of Species the year earlier. The Origin of Species was the, his very first, his major tome about evolutionary theories when he introduced the concept of evolution into Western discourse. 
Now, Darwin had been writing that book for about 20 years. It was ready to go, or more or less ready to go, for many of those 20 years. He compiled enormous amounts of evidence from his travels. He'd been thinking about this a long time. He was hesitant to publish the book because he knew it would create a firestorm. He knew it would put him into the limelight and make his life very difficult. He was a shy man. He was very religious. His wife was extremely religious. And he knew that many people would interpret evolutionary theory as challenging existing doctrine about God. It was widely believed and widely assumed then that God created everything. All the diversity of species happened because of God. Now, God could have created, one could say, God created evolutionary theory. And that's why it happens. That, would, that kind of works. But nobody was thinking that. Nobody was saying that. They were thinking, no, it says in the Bible that God created everything. So now you're telling us, no, that's blasphemy. He didn't want any of this. And he knew it would cause a real problem and things like this would happen. This is the 19th century version of trolling. Pictures like of uh, etchings like this, drawings of Darwin on a monkey's body began to appear in newspapers because he was assuming, well, we're all just monkeys, really. So this was not pleasant, and Darwin didn't want this any of this. He'd had an ulcer, and you know he was an anxious man, shy, anxious, introverted man. Now his book argued that he, that his book that was so controversial, argued that. Traits and behaviors evolve because they promote survival. If they promote survival, the creatures that have those traits and behaviors will survive and it'll, it'll be passed down on their genes. But what about the peacock? This is why the peacock made him sick. Why on earth would a bird, a species, evolve a tail like that? This is an enormous tail. And this is a big meaty bird. It has predators. And this big meaty bird is now has evolved this huge tail that says, I'm over here. If you want to eat me, here I am. You can see me. And when they have that tail in full, uh, when it, they, they lose it and it grows back, when they molt, they can't fly very well. So not only does the tail tell predators where they are, it also tells predators they're not going to be able to fly very well. And they do get caught by predators. They, they live in Southeast Asia and India and other places, and they get caught. And this is a cougar who just nailed a peacock. So how, did Dar how could Darwin solve this? solve this? It took him 10 years to solve this. <clears throat> and he did, uh, this, this cartoon gives you a clue what his solution was. He created the concept of sexual selection. He'd argued that females, the peahen, have unconsciously, by the continued preference for the most beautiful males, rendered the peacock the most splendid species of living bird. In other words, the tail evolved to attract, to attract mates for sex. The peacocks with the best tails would be more likely to have sex and the gene for the best tail would get passed down and their tail would get better and better over the course of evolution. It doesn't always work. Pea hens, the females are, are incredibly discerning about um, peacock's tails and they'll turn, they'll turn their backs on some tails and no, nope, not good enough, I've seen better. But it also does work. And when it works, then that those the peacock and the peahen will mate and the genes for that nice tail get passed down. Here's another example quickly, the cheetah. Cheetahs are incredibly beautiful creatures. They're, they're tall, slender. They're, they're the fastest terrestrial mammals on the planet. They can get up to 60 miles an hour in just three seconds. They have teeth and claws and they eat meat. You would not want to come across a hungry cheetah uh, on the plane on the savannah, because they could get to you in very short time. But there's a cost to this speed. I, 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 I'd like to ask you if anyone has an idea what the cost is, but that might be a little bit difficult with the chat and all. But I'll just ask you to think about that. What would be the cost of being such a beautiful, fast creature? Well, the cost is stamina. It takes an enormous, um, enormous amount of metabolic resources to, to go that fast. The metabolic needs are intense to reach that level of speed in just three seconds. So they can only do it for a little bit, about 30 seconds. And then they essentially run out of gas. They can't run anymore. So the creatures that they hunt have also evolved and they've evolved strategies um, have, that allow them to, to stall like zebra stripes, it's thought zebra stripes help them uh, blur the individual's zebras and that allows the cheetah, get, make, gives them a little bit of time to evade 
direct hits by the cheetah. And cheetah tracking studies have actually shown that cheetah um, lose most of the creatures they try to hunt down. They do not catch most of the creatures they try to hunt. Sometimes even when they have caught in a creature and killed it, another creature like a, a scavenger, like a hyena, will be bold enough to come in and snatch away the prey from them because they know they're probably too exhausted to chase them. So speed alone doesn't solve the problem. They need other tools. Now we get back to humans. Remember humans? We will, we're talking about humans. Back to humans. The same logic, the same uh, uh, rules of nature apply to humans. What we do has benefits and costs. Here's some examples. So for we think of some things like distraction and suppressing emotion. These are maladaptive. We think of them as maladaptive. But there's good science now that shows us that in some situations, these are very useful. In some situations, they're really helpful. And in my own research, we've looked at the ability to do these things, and we've shown that ability predicts better health. We did a study after 9-11 showing the ability to suppress emotion actually predicted who would be doing better over time. Just when it's needed, we use it. By the same token, there are some things we tend to think are always adaptive, like reappraisal, reframing, finding meaning, getting support from other people. These seem to be really great things, and they are. But in some situations, they don't work. And in some situations, believe it or not, they're actually counterproductive. They can cause harm. They can make us less healthy in some situations. And again, there's good research to support all this. This is a study I want to show you just briefly from my colleagues in Germany. Again, the same people that did the meta-analysis on COVID. This is Klaus Lieb's lab and Sarah Schaffer again. And this is a paper they just finished. It's not yet published. But they looked at 51 studies. And what they did is they summarized evidence on the predictive value of individual societal and social resilience factors. They just looked at a range of all these factors that people assume or have been shown to correlate with resilience. What they found, though, was that the findings were mixed for most of these factors. And they suggest support the importance of the fit between resilience and situational demands. So this is a figure from that study. This is dense, so I'm just going to tell you what this, what this is getting at. What they did here in these two boxes, one on each side, left and right, is they listed all the different predictors and correlates of resilience. And then they coded them from the literature, what they saw in the research li literature. Um, they coded them as green when they, in, in studies where they predicted better outcome, they predicted resilience. They coded them as red when they actually went the opposite way, when they, they predicted less resilience. And then they coded them as gray when they showed no effects. They didn't do, were neither here nor there. They didn't predict a better or a worse outcome. They put them on a continuum based on the strength of the evidence. No need to worry about that, but they had formula for how strong the evidence was. So here you can see these green studies, studies that had, where they showed that these various factors uh, in the, the rows actually predicted resilience. But then here you can see some of those same factors in other studies didn't predict anything. They were null. They just did, they didn't predict better or worse outcome. And some of those same factors even predicted a worse outcome in some studies. So you can see uh, from this chart that there's mixed findings for almost everything. And that's why the effects are small, because sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And this leads us to really a, a basic conclusion that we can make. What works in one situation may not be effective, may not be as effective, or could even be harmful in another situation or at another point in time, which is why we have the small effects. So this is really a crucial insight. Here's a silly slide showing you more or less the same thing. Yoga is great, but it's not a, it doesn't work all the time. What works in one situation, I'm going to repeat this, what works in one situation may not be as effective or could even be harmful in another situation or at another point in time. And this gives us these overall small effects. Now, the third thing we can, we can think about in trying to solve this paradox is that most people are resilient and I've shown you lots of evidence for this. We now have almost a hundred studies that have shown this. 
Therefore, most people must work this out somehow. We know that they work it out somehow. And this suggests if what works in one situation may not be, may not always work in others or may even be harmful in others, they must figure that out. They must be flexible enough to figure that out. And that's the key word here, flexibility. So this leads to my third point. Resilience requires engaging with the stressor and each time working out the best response. I call that regulatory flexibility. I first started talking about this back in 2004. Some of my students and I published a paper where we looked at the ability to show a lot of emotion or the ability to suppress the outward uh, expression of emotion. And we, we measured this in a bunch of students who had a large group of students who had been exposed to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And what we found was the ability to express emotion, but also the ability to suppress emotion predicted better adjustment two years later. And we calculated a flexibility score, the ability to kind of modulate those kinds of emotional expression or suppression predicted better adjustment. So these abilities are really useful to have. And if they're useful to have as an abilities, it means that we use them sometimes. It took me a while, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say, it took me a while to work all this out and to realize that this was probably the way resilient people were, were, were getting there. I've been doing the, the research on flexibility almost independently because I was interested in it. Science is driven by interest and curiosity. But at some point I realized this actually seems to be to fit together nicely, that flexibility is how resilient people are doing it. So we published this paper in 2013, beginning to make those points and we've continued to make those points. And we have now proposed this model for the last 10 years or so on flexibility, it has two parts. I wanna tell you about the two parts and walk you through it. We have a flexibility mindset, a way of thinking, and we have what I call the flexibility sequence, which is um, the, the nuts and bolts, the, the, the details of how we do it. The mindset is essentially a motivational piece. We have to be motivated to do this. So this is the motivational piece. And most theories about flexibility and most research includes a motivational component. And then we have the sequence, which is really the mechanisms and nuts and bolts. This is what the model looks like together. Um, it's, it, it's not very complicated. It looks more complicated than it is. So I wanna walk you through it. First, the mindset. We, we know, or we can, we, can, um, we can all agree, I think that managing difficult and distressing situations is exhausting. It's exhausting in different ways. So here are some images of people struggling in different ways. Uh, these are just the kind of things you can find online or people you work with that, that different stressors, they, they wear us out in different ways, but across all of these things, there's a lot of angst and distress and fear and worry. And these things, they, they, they vary by these different events, but they're all unpleasant. In order to, and we, we'd like to push this all away. We'd like it to go away. We'd like to just sit and say, oh, this is terrible. We, we, we do this sometimes. We wallow in our pain. It's very natural. We want to give up. This is just horrible. It's, I didn't want this to happen. Why did this happen? It's very natural initially, at least, to ask those questions and to feel that way. But ultimately, we need to engage with the situation if we want to move forward. We need to, we need to sort of, you know, think about it, face it, experience it more directly. And for that, we need motivation. We need to be willing to do that. But there's some things that we can tell ourselves that help us to do that. We, first of all, we have the tools to do it. Stress and emotional pain, it does not mean we're coping badly. Even resilient people experience stress and emotional pain. This is just the, the sort of natural byproduct of going through these events. But stress and emotional pain are necessary. We have a, we have a stress response system. We are born with the capacity for a stress response system. And in most people, it develops pretty well. But stress response system requires stress. It's a response to stress. So stress is essential. We first have to be upset and in pain in order for our mind and body system to kick in to help us move beyond that pain. 
And our brains are wired for it. Our brains are wired for flexible adaptation. And this is very interesting. I won't go into this too much, but it's super interesting. We have the longest developmental period in, in the animal kingdom. It takes us 25 years to, to reach full brain maturity. This is something that we've only kind of really learned recently, although insurance companies, auto insurance companies have known it for a long time because insurance rates go down after at the age of 25. So they knew something probably from the accident data. We also have the most cortical neurons. And I'm not talking about, cort about the size of our brains, I'm talking about the number of neurons in our cortex, which means complexity. So we have the most cort cortical neurons in the animal kingdom that goes hand in hand with the long period of development. And together, these things give us this remarkable capacity to learn and adapt. I want to show you some quotes from this recent book by Heather Haying and Brett Weinstein. And these, these guys are evolutionary theorists. And they wrote this wonderful book that came out just a couple of years ago called The Hunter-Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And what they're basically doing is looking at um, how we've evolved, which is generally when we're hunter-gatherers, but we're now in the 21st century as hunter-gatherers. So what, what does that evolution tell us? But when they, the, what's particularly interesting for what we're talking about here are these quotes. First of all, we're born atrichial or atrichiality. That means we're born helpless. There, there are different evolutionary strategies that people, that, that organisms use. Many organisms are born ready to go. They're precocial. They're, they, the, the infants come out and they can, within a matter of hours, they can walk away. And they could, in theory, survive on their own. Human infants cannot survive on their own for some time. And it takes us, as I mentioned, a long time to reach maturity. But that strategy, the helplessness of hatchlings, and newborns, atrichiality, it's not in itself an asset, it's a strategy. It has costs and benefits, but one of the benefits of this strategy is it opens the door to extraordinary things, behavioral flexibility, plasticity, emerges in organisms that are not fully programmed at birth, fully programmed by the genome. Humans are not, the, are not blank slates, but of all the organisms on earth, we are the blankest. We have the longest childhoods, as I've been mentioning, and we arrive in the world with more plasticity than any other species, meaning that we are the least set in stone. And this gives us flexibility in a changing world. Software, what they call software, the interplay of experience and knowledge with capacity, is more important in humans than in any other, any other species. It permits us to optimize our minds to whatever world we find ourselves born into. So this, this capacity really does allow us to adapt. And the flexibility mindset is essentially an appreciation of that. It's an attitude, a conviction, a belief that we can and we will find a way to adapt, to get through the difficult situation. And in fact, we can and we do. And the mindset is simply a, a way to a, a kind of an acceptance of that and, a, and a, a reminder of that when we tell ourselves that, we believe it. Here's a quote from Jed again, Jed, who was run over by the garbage truck. Um, in a book I recently wrote called The End of Trauma, he's in this book a lot. He allowed me to interview him at great length. And I think I mentioned that he was, he's been in my lab. Uh, he's now, uh, he's become a, um, a, a he, he received his PhD with me and he now works at the University of Washington as a rehabilitation psychologist. And he's an excellent contrib contributor to that field. But this is what Jed said about his accident. Thoughts like this might not get better were really bad, but other thoughts, this could get better or this is getting better or this is already better than it was. These thoughts helped me keep going. I don't know how conscious I was of doing it. You know, I didn't say to myself, oh, I have to reframe this. But when I was in that state, not knowing how long it was going to last and just feeling awful, you know, thinking, is this going to persist was really bad. That was really depressing. But if I thought this is bad now, but there's hope for the future. You know, it was like I was make, marking progress for myself. This is what we think the mindset is like now. Um, we're still doing a lot of research on this, but it seems to overlap with three other features in psychology. One is optimism, where we tell ourselves, the future is going to be okay. It'll be okay eventually. You know, this is bad now, but it will be okay eventually. And Confidence in coping is where we tell ourselves, I have some skills. Most people have some skills to manage things. I have the skills. I'm confident I have these skills. And something called challenge appraisal. 
This is where we focus on the challenge at hand. When we're first confronted with a, a seriously nasty event, um, we tell ourselves, boy, this is really bad. And we sort of have to do that. We have to assess the threat. We have to say, wow, this is really bad. This is gonna be difficult. And that's necessary. But if we stay focused only on that threat, we get kind of frozen there. We keep every day looking, how bad is it? How bad is it? How bad is it? But at some point, people shift to the challenge where they say, what do I need to do here? I'll do what is necessary. Let me get to it. What's the challenge? And that's what challenge appraisal is. And we find this, for example, in a study of spinal cord patients, we found that those who were resilient were doing a lot of challenge appraisal. So these are, these are very useful kind of ways of framing it. And you can see in this graph how optimism and challenge appraisal and confidence in coping, they're all kind of related. The arrows go both ways. And what the research has shown us is that one feeds into the other. So if people are optimistic, they're also more likely to look at the challenge. They're also more likely to tell themselves that they, they have some coping skills. If people are feeling like they're gonna focus on the challenge, that tends to make them more optimistic and that tends to also make them more confident. They take stock of what they can do. And these things kind of uh, have a synergistic quality that allows them to enhance each other. And in the end, what we get is this motivation and this sense of, I will be able to manage this. Now, there many people don't know about these, these things, confidence and optimism and challenge appraisal. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is to get to that motivation. I did a podcast called, um, what was it called now? Um, it was a kind of a tough guy survival podcast. I don't, I'm blanking on the name. Joe DeSena did the podcast. It was a very good podcast. And Joe DeSena, um, uh, it was a Greek, um, that Greek word, God, I can't remember now. Um, the Greek soldiers who were so tough. But in any case, um, <clears throat> he had told me, he, he runs a kind of a, a survival race where people have to, you know, in, in, in relatively little clothing, climb a rope ladder and then dive into an ice cold pond and swim across it and get out and climb up a muddy thing and then drag a, a huge weight up a long hill and then run over another obstacle. And, and people that do that race, when I told him about this model, he said, the people that do that race come out of it with the flexibility mindset you're talking about. They think they can do things and they, they believe it. They will manage. And I think anything in life that we accomplish can help us to believe, that, okay, I can do things, I can get by, I can manage. Think something as simple as moving to New York City and getting used to it. It's all right, I learned how to deal with this or moving to another place or taking on a new role in life or having children and realizing I can do this. These all help us to realize that we can adapt ourselves. And that adaptation, that sense is motivating and it's very important. I saw in this chat, Spartan Up podcast with Joe DeSena. That was it. Thank you for posting that. Um, but this motivation is very important because this then gives us the tool, th this gets us going and gets us engaged with the situation so we can actually become flexible. And this is what I call the flexibility sequence. It's kind of the nuts and bolts. It's how we work it out. And I want to walk you through that. So this is, a, this is the flexibility sequence. It starts off we're regulating ourselves and you're all regulating yourselves right now. What is it? It's, a, it's on the East Coast, it's 11 o'clock. You might be thinking, I wish I had some coffee. You might be thinking, well, I can have lunch in a little bit. Uh, you might be worried about finances. You might be worried about the Middle East. You might be thinking about your sports team. You might not be thinking about anything. You might be thinking this talk is fantastic. You might be thinking this talk is boring. You might be um, you know, surfing the web and reading the New York Times or whatever you're doing, but you're regulating yourselves. And whether the, the, the stressors are mild to moderate, but then sometimes in our lives, major things happen. The things that we've been talking about, things we don't want to happen, these very serious stressors. And when those happen, we're forced to evaluate the demands and opportunities. We're forced to ask ourselves, what's happening? What do I need to do? We don't like to do that. We don't want to do it. But, and that's why the mindset's important to get us engaged. We typically don't even realize we're doing this. Um, we don't quite know that it's not quite conscious because we've been doing this since we were children. We've been assessing 
situational variation. We've been assessing the different tasks in life since we're children. We're taught to do this by our teachers or students. We're taught to realize, okay, you can behave this way in this context, but not in this context. And when this has happens, this is how you might behave and not in this context. So we learn to read the cues of the context. And we call that context sensitivity. And our research has shown us that people vary in this ability. Not everybody reads the context with the same skill. It's an important skill. This is one of my favorite examples. This is a New York subway platform. Not everybody uh, has been on a subway platform in New York or not everybody's in New York and, and, and understands what I'm about to tell you. So this is a very typical platform. Take the stairs down. There are very few elevators in New York subway. So you take the stairs down and you arrive at this platform. Lots of stuff going on on this platform. But once you get used to riding the subway or living in New York, you start picking up the cues. So here's some. On the right, there are hardly any people on the right. There looks like, uh, what is it, three people. They're all walking away. I can't quite make out the, maybe the third person is standing there, but at least two people are walking away. And this tells you either a train just arrived recently because the people are walking from the train or no train is coming because there aren't any people waiting for it. So the, you, you got some information there. We look at the left side and we can see there are a lot of people on the left side. So they're waiting for a train on the left side. The train hasn't just come. But you can also see that these two people, they're looking down the tracks. And that looks like they're waiting for a train. They're looking at this woman that's on the right uh, sitting down is also looking that way. So people are looking at the tracks. Actually, the other woman is too. So they're looking down the tracks. That's a little bit unusual because when, the, you know, simply just wait for the train, it comes when it comes. When people are looking down the track, it usually means that the train is late or it hasn't come yet or it's coming soon, but you have information there. There are also a lot of people. If there are enormous amounts of people, you know, it's very late and it's going to be very crowded. Then you can see there are signs up. You, unless you ride the subways, you wouldn't know what this is, but these are paper signs that tell you about service changes. So the sign on the left might be telling you which trains are not running right now. The sign on the right might be telling you that train actually is not running or there's some problem, et cetera. So all this information, you get used to looking at this information when you ride the subways without thinking, you just take stock and people vary in how well they do it. But when we're coping with serious adversity, we're also reading our bodies. We're, we're, we're picking up cues from the situation we're in, but we're also reading our bodies for what's going on inside of us. And that's often the source of, of, of the, it's often the, the problem that we're trying to solve is our, our sense of unease or, or our having nightmares or our sense of uh, intrusive thoughts and, and, and uh, you know, fears and worries. So our bodies and what we get from our bodies is a source of information. And people also vary in the extent that they can read their own bodies. It's a great source of information. So we evaluate the demands and opportunities. We ask ourselves what's happening and we kind of set a goal. We figure out what we need to do. And then we move to the next step where we actually do something. We select the regulatory strategy. We use a resource, but here we ask ourselves a new question, not only what do I need to do, but what am I able to do? Because people have different tools in their toolboxes. We call this the repertoire. And again, people vary in the extent that they can use their repertoire. How well, what kind of repertoire they have. A large repertoire of things we know we can use is very helpful. So what I normally do if I have more time in kind of workshop scenarios, I would have people do this exercise or some exor exercise like this, excuse me. So I would ask you, and you can do this, we can take a couple minutes. I think we have a couple minutes we can do this. Um, just we'll, we'll just do this, say two minutes. Take a few minutes and think about how you respond to adversity. What do you do? What do you think? How do you regulate your emotions? How do you cope? How do you actually do it? It's very important to do this when you're not experiencing a great deal of stress, because when we experience a great deal of stress, it's very hard to think clearly. So to think to yourself, what can I do here? What are my strategies? It's very hard because we just can't think. We're like deer in headlights. But now is a good time. When you, when you, have, uh, when you have a quiet period in life or a, a stimulating period in your life, the, the time in your life, when you can simply think this through. 
And you can write down all the ways you think you've been able to cope or regulate your emotions or all the ways you're able to change the way you feel or adapt. You know, just write down as many as you can think of right now. Don't worry about the overlap. Just record them somewhere where it's accessible. I'll give you a, a minute or two to do this and, um, and then we'll, we'll pick it up from there. It's pretty basic. Just write down the things that you think you can do or things you have done. How do you regulate yourself? Okay. Um, hi, everybody. We're back. I, I'll, I'll stop here because we don't have really enough time. This is just a, a little taste of what a kind of an exercise like this would be. But the key point is that when we're, again, I'll repeat, when we're in a, situ when we're in a situation that's distressing us, that requires us to respond in some way, we're, we're typically, it's hard to think. So it's a good idea to get a sense of what you do. And you can think about this over time. You can add more strategies as you think of them in the future when you discover new strategies. If we're doing this together. You might, we might uh, in, a, in a workshop or something, or you do this with other people you know, we might talk about our different strategies people use and it might remind you of others that you've actually used or give you ideas about some. And this eventually becomes your personal repertoire. So it's what we're doing is just trying to get a sense of what is our personal repertoire. Now, there's another part to this that is um, you may find a little odd. I call this coping ugly. And this is also things that we can use not often, but sometimes situations are strange enough or difficult enough. We need, just need to use what works. So this, I want to read this to you. This is from, I coined this idea in, uh, in 2005. And then in a book in 2009 and a couple other places, and I've hung on to it since, the dynamic nature of regulatory processes stands out in even starker relief when we are confronted with potentially traumatic events. Extreme conditions, really difficult things, oblige us to, oblige us to put aside our normal concerns and shift to what I've called pragmatic coping. We focus only on survival, whatever it takes. We just have to get over this. We have to get through it. And that whatever it takes can often involve strategies or behaviors or resources that we wouldn't normally consider using or even consider healthy. For this reason, I've referred to this as coping ugly. But when the chips are down and we are struggling, we what we do need not be pretty or satisfying, it need, or pretty or satisfying conventional wisdom. It just needs to work. And I often think of the John Lennon song here, whatever gets you through the night. It's the idea that right now in a situation you're in, if you're really struggling, whatever you can do to get you moving forward is, is, is even if it seems unhealthy, you're not doing it all the time, just once or twice, that could be adaptive. Here are some examples. Engaging in wistful thinking or passive acceptance, doing nothing, lying to oneself, escaping or leaving, getting drunk or using drugs, complaining. Complaining is a great, complaining, doesn't solve any problem, but sometimes it feels good. If you do it all the time, of course you get nowhere, but just once in a while, you just want to complain. Engage in self-pity, trying to find comfort in food or sex, avoiding people, blaming somebody. These are all examples of what people have done and do sometimes just, you know, they, they're not doing it all the time because would, that would be unhealthy, but just in a situation where they need them. And alcohol is a really interesting example. This was a poster that was in the hallway at Columbia. I saw, um, do alcohol, does, do any alcohols have any specific benefits? The obvious answer for this group was no. Um, and alcohol is essentially poison. We're putting poison in our body. You know, during the pandemic, you could use alcohol to clean your hands. But it turns out, uh, this was a book by Edward Slingerland, a very interesting book. He's an evolutionary philosopher. That's what he calls himself. But he argued that every civilization in recorded history has used alcohol and that alcohol does a lot of good things. As much as it's not so good, it does some good things. Virtually all societies have used alcohol in abundance promote, that promotes creativity, social bonding, relaxation, et cetera. This is a funny little study that's done that showed that fruit flies drink alcohol when they can't have sex. Um, a lot of creatures like fruit flies prefer rotting fruit over fresh fruit because the sugars are more accessible and they also get drunk. And there's been research showing that fruit flies get drunk. 
But then what these researchers discovered was that alcohol has a, a, a reward chemical, a neuropeptide F, that does boost, it, it has an effect similar to sex. It, it gives us a sense of, of, of reward and, and, uh, and boost, it boosts our mood. That chemical neuropeptide F drops after rejection. So actually drinking has a way of restoring those normal concentrations. And what they showed was these fruit flies, they put fruit flies in, like male fruit flies in, uh, containers with females, and the females either had already mated so they wouldn't be uh, open, receptive to mating, or they hadn't. The males that mated um, behaved somewhat normally. The males that didn't have a chance to mate, they had a choice between two, two um, uh, drinks they could have, and they chose one of them had a lot of higher alcohol content, and they chose the one that had alcohol as they were coping ugly, you could say. Anyway, um, Getting back to this, um, the model. So we pick a regulatory strategy where at this point in the model, we've read the context, what's happening to me, what do I need to do? Then we looked at our repertoire to figure out what we can do. And then we do something. We come to the third stage. It, this is a very important stage as well. We monitor and modify what we've done. And this has received very little attention, but we've done a lot of research on it. We're now asking ourselves a third question. Is it working? We call this the feedback stage because we're actually collecting feedback both from our bodies and from the world around us. And we use this feedback to then decide whether we should keep doing the strategy, adjust it, maybe select a new strategy. We try that a few times. If we keep trying new strategies and we're not getting anywhere, then we sometimes go back to the original, to the beginning and ask ourselves, so what is really happening? Maybe I'm focusing on the wrong task, et cetera. Uh, and that's really this model. I think that I didn't say this, but the third stage, the feedback stage is super important because I think a lot of people, when they reach that point where they try something and it doesn't work, then they give up. They think, I can't do this. This is just too hard. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But, the, but even the most resilient people that our research has shown will in fact cope by trial and error. It's the way humans behave. We cope by trial and error. Humans, organisms, all organisms on earth cope by trial and error. They try something. They may have a pretty good guess of what's going to work, but if it doesn't work, they try something else. And we do the same thing. So we need to keep trying, trying different strategies until we work it out. And if that doesn't work, then we go back. If, if we try a few strategies and that doesn't work, then we go back to the beginning and, and try to reassess the situation. We might go through this many times um, in the course of the same event. And every time we come up with a new event, we go through these same strategies. Um, I want to briefly tell you before I uh, run out of time, um, the, a, a lot of this work is, is all, all of this work essentially, pretty much everything I've told you is described in this recent book of mine, The End of Trauma. Um, I've written a couple books recently. This is the most recent one. And in this book, I have a table of what is called self-talk statements. A lot of this comes from the work of Ethan Cross, but lots of other researchers. And each one of these pieces of the flexibility uh, model, the flexibility mindset in the sequence, had some self-talk involved in it. The future will be okay. I have the skills, I'll do what is necessary for these components of the mindset. And then what I just showed you, what's happening, what do I need to do for context sensitivity? What am I able to do for the repertoire? And then is it working? So these are ways that you can, we can actually use these. And I use these in my personal life. I'll just tell you honestly, when I'm coping with things, it helps remind me of what I need to do. The table in the book also has a couple other versions of this. The one in the middle is called distance self-talk. And here we insert our names into it. So if you're saying to yourselves, like at the very top, the future will be okay, I would hear say, George, the future will be okay, or the future will be okay, George. And what, what that does, and the research, Ethan Cross's research has shown us this and others, that when we, in a sense, put our names in it, it might feel a little funny, but we're actually gives us a kind of a, it makes coping a little easier because we're it's a little bit like being a fly on the wall. We're having a dialogue with ourselves, but we're also kind of watching ourselves. We're talking to ourselves as if we're in the room. 
And that makes it a little bit easier, it gives people a little distance from that. Finally, on the right um, are just some other ways of, of saying these same things. And I, I thought people can come up with whatever kind of self-talk they, they, that feels most comfortable to them and helps do these, helps people, uh, helps us do these different procedures. It, it, it's just a good, they're good reminders. They're effective in that they kind of concentrate what we're thinking about, but they also remind us of what we can do. All right, moving forward, um, I'm gonna go through this. I don't think I'm gonna spend much time on this, but basically this was an analysis we showed that most people are able to use all three of these components. And that was a very important finding that most people can, can use these three components that we, we've been assuming, I've been assuming that most people, because most people are resilient, this is how they're doing it. So we should find in fact that most people uh, can do the, use these components effectively, at least moderately well, and that is in fact what we found. We did find that people had some deficits too, and that led to different kinds of problems, but the deficits were typically in one of these components, which meant that we could target that for improvement or intervention. Um, this was a, another study done in, um, in Ireland, but they, they, I was involved in it, but this was led by Sharia Armour's lab, and what they did was they looked at all the different paths between these things in a trauma exposed sample. And what they found was the path that best predicted less anxiety, depression, and PTSD was the sequence through these different components as the model predicted. Um, ah, this is another one. I don't want to tell you about this, but this is we're now doing what's called an ecological momentary assessment with people's phones. And we're trying to um, assess flexibility in real time. Uh, by, by texting people four times a day for 21 days and, and measuring what they're doing and how they're doing it, are they correcting it? And basically what we found is that basically people are able to do this. We did this study in the US and in China. Um, so that's, that's more of the research. Let me just remind you, I've told you a lot. Let me remind you of the three axioms of resilience. Resilience to potential trauma is common, most people show a stable trajectory of healthy functioning after even the worst events, most people are going to be able to move on. It doesn't mean they, they're, they're, they didn't suffer, but it means they can continue to function and live their lives in a healthy way after these events. We know though it's not simple and that having just a few of these key traits, there are no key traits. The few key traits won't make us resilient because there aren't any and there isn't a type of person that's just resilient. It's not that simple. It really has to do with what I've called flexibility. And that's each time something happens, we need to engage with that event, dig in with it, um, motivate ourselves and work out the best response. And we do that through kind of a trial and error process I just showed you where we we, we, we read the situation, we try something from our toolkits in a sense that we, we make a guess, our best guess, and then we see if it, if it helps. And if it does, we're good until the, until the stressor changes. If not, we try something else and we keep, keep running through that. Um, I'm gonna stop now. This is, uh, I wanna quickly thank the people that have been paying for my research over the years. I've been very lucky to be funded uh, by my whole career. And I wanna thank you for your time and attention. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Bonanno, for this uh, illuminating uh, presentation, uh, just giving us a lot, a lot to think. And uh, as I said at the beginning, especially in these difficult times that we are being fa facing a lot of uh, potentially traumatic events, as uh, as you call them. Uh, we're now going to move into a, a discussion a portion of these uh, uh event uh, and we have for that uh, uh, the scientific director of the Melissa Institute, Do Dr. Donald Meikenbaum, and uh, I'll leave you with him uh, to chat on a few issues uh, that uh, of importance uh, uh, to all of us. Take it on, uh, Don. Well, thank you, George. That was a terrific presentation uh, to have you go from peacocks to fruit flies to cheetahs to humans <laughs> all in one talk is very impressive. Um, I'm a big fan of yours, and um, one of the things that I'd like you to comment on is that for the last 200 weeks on the New York Times bestseller has been a book by Bessel van der Kolk, 
that the body keeps score. Yeah. And I was wondering, you know, and I, I have proposed that your book should be on there for the next 200 weeks. But um, I was wondering if you had any comments on uh, his book and the kind of thinking that he engages in compared to what you're describing. Yeah, um, I do. Um, I've noticed, it's interesting, um, when I first began to study resilience, um, it, it was kind of ignored. Um, it didn't fit the dominant narrative of, of the time. And I think that that makes sense. Historically, people were trying to understand trauma uh, and, and you know, somebody saying, well, most people are resilient. Wasn't, there wasn't interest in that. But then after 9-11, it changed and the, the world kind of became became focused on this question. So what's going to happen now? And the research, my research, other people's research after 9-11 showed that most people were resilient and it began to change. And there was a lot of interest in this idea that there are different reactions to traumas and that most people aren't traumatized and there's resilience. And I was very um, pleased by that shift in the in sort of societal perspective, gave myself a little pat on the back that good work, George, you, you've helped move this along. And then without my realizing it, things shifted back. And I don't know exactly how that happened. I think it had a lot to do with the internet, to be honest with our, our need to, um, uh, we, we're wired to perceive threat and the internet is knows this and the internet is a money maker. And so you see threat everywhere and you know newspapers will tell you about disturbing things all the time. You click on them, it's click so-called clickbait so in that context um i began to notice that i teach a very large lecture course on trauma and i began to notice that the students each at the beginning of the year were more and more coming to class with very um different ideas about trauma than they were going to learn in my class um it's an auditorium class and i was curious about that why is this changing and I think within that kind of cultural shift is, why, is one reason why Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, has become so popular. Because what there's a certain idea that I think that's developed that, that we are traumatized and broken. And when we discover that, then that's the explanation for all the problems we have. And it's there are traumas that are hidden in us. And one of the ideas that, um, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt champions in his work is that trauma is in your body and it's not knowable in sense essentially and um, the you know the only way to get at it is through different kinds of body work and things like that and, but it's the idea that you have these hidden memories and you they're 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 implicit they're not known and they're hidden and they're in your body not in your brain and in fact none of that is actually possible um, the brain runs the body. My good friend, Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, who's a brilliant person, and she had said, what was the, her quote? Um, the brain keeps the score. The body is the scorecard. And in fact, the idea that, um, that there are hidden traumas, I think is very popular. There's no conceptual reason that I know of. There's no biological mechanism that I know that can cause hidden traumas. People that have been traumatized and very disturbed by traumas know it. And they don't forget it. They, they, they remember those events and they don't want those events. But people can be convinced that they have hidden traumas. And for some so, reason- Yeah, I was just gonna add that I, over the years I've debated Van de Kolk. And one of the things that becomes interesting is that the body, if you buy his analogy, also keeps track of resilience, right? You know, uh, that there are certain correlates of what you've been engaged in, in terms of positive emotions or coping responses or exercise. So I appreciated your comment. And the, the other observation I'll make, and I'll let the audience have their turn, is uh, for a number of years, we developed this procedure called stress inoculation training. Uh-huh. I know it very well. Uh, yeah. yeah. And in fact, it, it sort of highlights a lot of the self-talk that you've been describing. So uh, once again, uh, kudos for taking the field in a new direction. And I do hope your book replaces his book for the next 200 weeks. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, Etioni, let's <laughs> open it up to the audience for their questions or comments. Yes, uh, and uh, I do hope also that you make it to the list. I like to have a, a friend in the list, uh, best uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have provided the audience here uh, with uh, a paper I'm about to present called How to Spot Hype in the Field of Trauma. And you'll, you'll see that there is a book by Swanninger recently that analyzes all of the claims that um, that Bessel van der Koop makes. So I encourage people to visit that and and make their own judgments. All right. So I have a, a question here from uh, the audience that uh, and has to do with your thoughts and comments about the uh, um, the ACES kind of like literature and research. Uh, and yes. uh, is one of the you know one of the trendy friends of a. Uh, uh, nowadays for trauma. Uh, so what are your thoughts about, about that in relationship to PTEs? Um, well, I think there's, I don't know, the, the word ACEs is used differently, but there is a, a, often people are talking about retrospective measures of trauma, um, yeah. you know, where people's life history of trauma is recorded in a questionnaire. And I think that's pretty much unreliable. And very, I think I'd actually even say dangerous because we're not very good at remembering our pasts. And when we're doing poorly, and there's research has shown this, when we're doing poorly, we're more likely to remember or sometimes even invent events in the past because it fits with the way our minds are working at the moment. So, um, so I think um, it doesn't help very much and it can, it's potentially harmful. There have been studies that have followed people from childhood into adulthood. And what those studies have shown very clearly is that experiencing potentially traumatic events, aversive events, does not put you at risk for, for PTSD in the, as an adult. And the reason is because those events only are harmful if they cause PTSD at the time. So going through you know, a, a very seriously traumatic event uh, in, in the past can put you at risk for PTSD. If that event was seriously traumatic and caused prolonged PTSD, then the person feels vulnerable and it makes them a little bit more at risk in the future. But going through an aversive event, a potential traumatic event and not being, not experiencing prolonged psychological damage does not put us at risk. So that's, I think, this actually even harkens back to the Bessel van der Kolk idea. We've all been through difficult events and the research shows us really clearly, epidemiological research. We are exposed to difficult things at different points in our lives. And those things, we, they get called traumatic events, which is a misnomer actually, which is, this is why I use potentially traumatic event as a phrase, because going through one of those events does not put us at risk in the future, does not mean we're traumatized. It means we've been through something difficult. And often people even forget those events. So sometimes when they're reminded of those events in the, in, in the present, that it, it's often either either told or it's framed as if you've had a trauma in your past. And that makes people then think that they've been damaged in their past. But the research clearly shows that's typically not the case. So I think just giving people questionnaires for the, the events they've had in the past or, or, or trying to dig up those events without the proper context and saying, you know, well, people go through things and it doesn't necessarily mean they've been traumatized, that I think it's dangerous to do that without that kind of broader frame. Thank you very much. I have uh, another question having to do with, uh, I believe some of the data that you presented is, uh, uh, which indicated that the, uh, the rates of uh, resiliency uh, pathways, so to speak, among youth were somewhat lower than for uh, adults. And yes. so the question is, can you talk about the, the, that finding and any specific findings or processes that may be different for children, adolescents, and adults? Yes, and that's an excellent question. I'm glad that question came up. Um, and I think I only had one study on the list there. And so there's a lot more we can say about that. So I, development is very complicated. You know, the, the development like up to adolescence say is very complicated. It continues to be complicated until adulthood. 
Um, so children are at different phases in development and understand different things. But what most of the, the research on childhood resilience is focused on is on chronic adversity. So very seriously chronic adversity. Um, like when, for example, studies of abuse typically study children who've been abused chronically. So they've been through a lot. Studies of, there've been studies of children in war contexts, but they've been, they're usually long drawn out wars, civil wars. And those children have, that resilience is a different phenomenon in, in, in the context of chronic stress. It looks different. You don't expect somebody, so for example, right now, if you could go into the Gaza Strip right now, you wouldn't expect a bunch of people walking around with no symptoms at all. You would expect people distressed, upset, angry, anxious, et cetera. You go anywhere where things like that are happening and where there's civil war, bombing, you would experience that kind of thing. Um, and what, what we, when we get into resilience in chronic adversity is when that stressor ends and then people have a chance to move back into their normal lives and then you see the resilience. So it's a different phenomenon. And I think there's a there's been a confusion between the adult liter and the adult literature and the child literature because typically the child literature is focused on these chronic events and the adult literature is focused on acute events, isolated events. So if but there are but there have been studies that have flipped that story. So there are studies, for example, of children taken to an emergency department for a traumatic injury, and those children show about the same level of resilience, that resilience profile as adults do. It's the majority of those children. It's not lower, it's about the same. But if you take adults who are in chronic stressor situations, they'll sh they won't show that resilience trajectory at all until that stressor ends. And we call that emergent resilience. So it's really different phenomenon. So when we're talking about chronic stress, it's a, it's a whole different phenomenon. And we will we'll see a different story, um, not the absence of resilience, but we see a different kind of resilience in the concepts of chronic stress. But I think that children are just as resilient, maybe even more resilient than adults to acute events. And I think that's what the literature shows. Thank, thank you very much. I have a question for you. There is a, for many, many people in the audience, uh, including us here at the Institute, we, a lot of the work that we do is, is with communities that live in, in, in with what we would describe as high levels of toxic stress. You know, it's a, uh, it's a chronic condition in life. They, um, uh, social ills, you know, inequalities, mm -hmm. uh, lack of resources and opportunities to access those resources, etc. Uh, I wonder if, uh, it seems to me that your work has implications for that. And I wonder if you had kind of like a, um, thought about this in, in that context, thought about your work uh, on resiliency as a as an antidote for this kind of a, uh, toxic stress. Um, well, that's a, that's a really interesting point. I think that um, people do cope, people do cope and can cope with all kinds of things that happen. And um, I think there's a question of, of the adversities people are, are experiencing and how they regulate themselves. And then there's the resources. Resources mm -hmm. help. There's undeniable that resources help. So when people are in context without resources, um, they, um, they have more in a sense to deal with less they have less they have fewer tools in a sense but they do many people are able to cope i think what what i would think of is is providing people with whatever that they can hold on to in, in caustic situations would be a good idea with, with the assumption that they will be able to manage it better and they will be able to manage they will be i say i should say this that people will be able to manage a lot of adversity and the more we can help people along the better you know, so one of my colleagues studies um, cortical thickness in, in children born into single mothers in poverty. And by one year of age, the children in, the, in those situations already have less cortical thickness. They're already at a lot, at a deficit in terms of their brain capacity at one year of age. So what, what, what they're doing is they actually did this wonderful study where they simply gave single mothers money for once a month for a period of time. And by the first year of life, that deficit in those children was had was no was not evidenced. 
So, you know, that's, that's a, addressing those resources. Um, and there are other ways we can address that kind of very complicated social problems. But at the same time, I guess my work would suggest that people are going to be able to manage it uh, on their, with, their, with their human skills. Um, but let's try to make it, you know, the, the more we can give them, the less, we, less difficult we can make it, the better. That would be how I would put it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and Don, uh, do you have a question or do you want to? Uh... What, what are you currently working on, George? What's the um, next thing we should look forward to? Um, I'm working on the flexibility idea um, very much. Um, I'm developing a training right now. Um, we've just finished it. This is the first time in my career I've done anything like that. We've developed a training. We're about to start using it with uh, transitioning veterans. So we're, we're, we're doing a very large research project on soldiers as they transition back into civilian life. And what we've found in that work so far is that most soldiers don't struggle. And this is a little bit related to the question Anthony just asked um, that most soldiers don't develop PTSD, but they do struggle with the transition. And the transition is complicated for soldiers becoming veterans. They're young uh, when they join the military typically, and, and they become adults in the military, and then they leave the military and the, the rules are very different in civilian life compared to, to military. And they often don't have transferable skills and it's very stressful. So we're now developing a training related to flexibility for that group and we're going to test it. We wanna have data on it to make sure that we can show that it actually does help people. Uh, so that's one of the things that's occupying me a great deal right now, that research. Well, let, let me interject, because I've written about this. When soldiers come home, the VA assesses them for psychopathology. Yeah. Okay. They assess them. Do you have problems sleeping, relating to others with anger? They rarely, if ever, ask them, what evidence of resilience did they have from the war? Uh, How did they look after their buddies? What particular role did they play? So I would encourage you in your project to ask them, what is it that they engaged in from the war experience or their combat or you know their service that they can now use in the transition? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful. So if we assess for psychopathology, that's what people focus in on. Yeah. So I have been, I've written, you can go on the Melissa Institute line on how to boast the resilience especially in this kind of transition period. Homecoming stress is the best predictor of, uh, and there are various scales for homecoming stress. Yeah. That you may want to, any, anyway, I, I think you're right on target. No, this is a great point, Don. It's really a great point. And, and I, we, we don't, we ask a lot about how they regulate themselves and things like that, but we don't ask anything as targeted as that. And I, I really think that's a fantastic point. That's, I'm going to look up those papers and, yeah. yeah a little bit but yeah it's a fantastic point because it, it's right on the money i think That's so i wrote a book called roadmap to resilience okay mm -hmm. and i put it online for free okay and in fact it's been downloaded by forty six thousand people in 138 countries so your message is out there uh in terms of that so people can actually from my hype article, see how to access that free copy of that book. Wonderful that it's a free copy. <laughs> Everything on the Melissa Institute is for free. So have fun. <laughs> All right. Well, George, uh, this has been wonderful. It's uh, It's been great to have you with us. Uh, you're welcome back. Anytime you want to uh, uh, spread another set of ideas, uh, let us know. Uh, we'll be watching also. Keep in tab on your work. Uh, what we do is mainly the training part that you are just joining, the world that you're joining right now. So we'll be more than happy to be a resource to you if you need uh, support and at that, at, you know, on that end. And uh, we got plenty of ex expert trainers associated with the institute, including Don and others. Uh, so uh, I wish you. The best of luck in everything. I want to thank you uh, really, really for, for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. It's an illuminating conversation. I see in the comments and a lot of great people from the community saying that this is giving them hope, uh, um, providing them hope into the field of trauma and resiliency, which I think is, uh, is most needed. So thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. It's been a really great experience. I'm delightful, to, delighted to have had the chance to talk with you all and meet you all. And, and thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, you're smart for choosing to spend this morning with us and learning about resilience and uh, learning about uh, flexibility. And um, I invite you to uh, make use of our resources at the Melissa Institute. And you can see there, there you can scan it and it will take you right to a lot of our resources available right now, as well as to, uh, I believe, will take you to the uh, directly to the, uh, Don's book on Roadmap to Resilience, uh, which, as he said, is available for free. Keep in mind that uh, uh, this is our last training for the uh, year. Uh, we start in January with a wonderful uh, presentation on uh, conspiracy beliefs and their relationship to violence uh, by uh, uh, colleague from the UK and um, hope, hope to have you with us back then. Until then, you know, have a wonderful uh, holiday season and take care. Bye-bye.